Hello, everyone out there, virtually and here at CIC. Welcome to the inaugural episode of New Views, where creative agency meets and attempts to spark civic imagination. Our goal here is to dive deeper, to ask the questions about our civic collective systems that aren't necessarily talked about because we see this as a critical moment that we need to move forward as a group, you know, less about the individual and more about how we are working together. That's why I embrace the word civics, the, the study of our rights and responsibilities. That is a term here that I've talked a lot about with Bob Massey, who I'm so welcoming here as our first guest. Bob, in so many ways, has been an inspiration to me for his run for governor, for his work, establishing so many organizations, including the New Economy Coalition, um, his work with Ceres, um, your work with the Global Reporting Initiative. Um, you're just always your authentic track record for fighting for people and pushing humanity forward. And, and now, today, it's, it's so fitting that your new role as uh, chief, you know, senior consultant to the chief executive of the Global Reporting Initiative, which you had a great role in creating, um, it's so cool that today we are now discussing restructuring global economic systems, which is a happy topic, that folks out there. So we you know we appreciate your contribution to the chat. Um, in person and online, because we want to make this a forum. We want people to talk about this, and we're really excited to have you here, Bob. So I, I just want to welcome you as a starting point, and you know, briefly, can you talk about, well, I want to, before I regret uh, not mentioning, the CIC, the Cambridge Innovation Center and the Venture Cafe here is actually where I first met Bob. True. It was, in a, so it's amazing full circle to be having this event here today. Um, and to be having Bob as our first guest. So, um, Bob, do you mind, you know, introducing yourself briefly, but kind of structuring it around your new position with the Global Reporting Initiative? Well, Tom, thank you very much, and thanks to everybody out there. Um, I think it's so important to have places where we can have this kind of conversation. And Tom, one of the things I noticed about you when we first got together and worked together on my campaign and a whole bunch of other things is that you have that deep, uh, that deep set of questions that you want to get out there. And I think it's very important. So to talk just briefly about myself, um, I, uh, I grew up uh, in the 1960s, 1970s, very turbulent times when the core idea of what was America's purpose, what our values should be, were being debated. Many of the same questions today, but uh, as today, but there were earlier form. And I became very interested my father is a, actually a fairly well-known historian, and one of the things that he taught me is that systems do change. History does change. Uh, we see change happening all the time. And the question is, can we identify and influence that change so that the change helps people and uh, represents our values and includes more people and, and leads to, to uh, human flourishing? It's exactly the kind of thing that uh, we need to think about, but every generation has to think about a new set of issues because our ideas expand, our technology expands. And I was saying to Tom earlier, you know, it occurred to me the other day that my grandfather's grandfather was born 200 years ago in the presidency of Andrew Jackson. I mean, it's incredible. And my grandfather was born in the 19th century in China. And at a time before there was electricity, time there was all of the technologies that we rely on didn't exist, and that was my father's father. And if you think about all of the things that have cascaded into our life and into my own life, you realize that every, every moment can be an inflection point as, as new ideas come on board, as we've become a much closer world, as ideas have been uh, opened up, and as we've realized that our common humanity is something that needs to be protected, it needs to be advanced, it needs to be respected, and as we know, Tom, and we've talked about many times, so often the powerful take those changes and attempt to turn them to their use, to the use of a small elite group uh, that seeks its own benefit. So the way I look at what you're saying, Tom, is, is that we need to be alert and engaged at every moment so that we can identify what are the opportunities to turn the system to the benefit of everyone and what are the dangers when it can be turned away. So in my own life, I pursued that very strange career. I was very involved in the anti-apartheid movement as a student. 
I worked for Ralph Nader many years ago, thinking about corporate power in America. Um, I actually uh, went to divinity school because I think there's a very fundamental spiritual set of questions, but I realized I needed much better training if I wanted to think about and confront economic problems. I got a doctorate from Harvard Business School. And believe me, that was a weird thing to get way back more than 30 years ago. Um, and I really wanted to talk about sustainability before that term even existed. And so in my life, I've seen it come into being. I've had the chance to lead several organizations that helped to advance it. Uh, 25 years ago, I started this new system for corporate accountability, measuring non-financial uh, performance, which really triggers a very basic question about what is capitalism and where is it going? And then I even had the chance to run for governor here in Massachusetts, which was a thrilling enterprise. Only missed it by 100,000 votes or so, but uh, it was a great experience. And so I'm delighted to be here. And I really hope everybody out there and everybody in this room contributes to the conversation because you can probably tell I can talk a lot but it's not what I think as much as it's what we think. And we want to get that out in a way. And again, Tom, thank you for creating that venue and opportunity to do that. It's so inspiring to listen to your achievements and to bring them into this conversation. And everyone out there, again, this is a collective conversation. It's a forum. We're trying to dive deeper. And the exercise here as this monthly program is how do we improve our messaging around these issues? I firmly believe, and you know, I welcome your opinions out there if you don't agree with me, but I think that the, there's a majority coalition of humans who have the same values. And the, to me, it's why aren't we enacting policy to reflect those values? And I, my exercise here, and we don't, it's, it's more of a theme of the show is this lens of rights and responsibilities. There's a, a lot of UN treaties that touch on these things but Bob, you really inspired to me, and we can touch on this briefly, is in order to have human rights, you need to have collective responsibilities to make sure that those rights are enshrined, protected, and even have the resources to enforce them. And could you just briefly touch on that connection between rights and responsibilities that you've been such a you know, great teacher about? Well, we have a huge number of problems today, Tom, but uh, we should re recognize that we've also seen some significant progress. And so just you mentioned rights. I mean, you know, if we if you look at the beginning of the 20th century, what did you have? You had basically European countries trying to divvy up the whole world uh, through colonialism to build extractive industries that sucked those resources out, stole them from local people in order to make those countries and elites within those countries and many of them white men, to be specific, uh, richer. And that system was enforced brutally, and it was unquestioned except by people considered way out on the fringe. And so, um, so you had constant explosions of discontent as people said, that's not how we want to be. And we had two major world wars that were absolutely devastating uh, to all societies. So after World War II, Eleanor Roosevelt and many others not only helped create the UN, but they created the UN Declaration of Human Rights. And that was one of the first times where you could say, it doesn't matter who you are, where you were born, what color you are, what, what amount of wealth you had, you had rights. And so we've been fighting that ever since. And part of the whole um, debate has been, well, who is going to... Uh, articulate those rights, represent them, uh, live up to them. And just to mention something, uh, it used to be that it was up to countries, so the UN was a group of countries, to then go and push whoever happened to live or whatever institutions. And one major shift in the last 25 years is the UN said, it's not just countries, it's big international institutions like corporations, which also should live up to the International Declaration of Human Rights. So. We now see, I mean, you know, I look back at my own life. Uh, when I was growing up, I thought it was absolutely normal when I, for example, looked at, just to give you one funny example or a strange example, a concert where you'd have a wonderful female performer like Jacqueline Dupre, who played the cello, and every single person in the orchestra was, uh, was male. And nobody thought about that in the elite. So we've had significant advances. We're not done by a long shot. 
Um, we haven't recognized economic rights, I think, enough. We have a system that often deprives people of economic power and of uh, wealth that we tolerate. Uh, so I've been working against that. So to, to answer your question in one sense, these rights have been born, but sometimes we can focus too much on what other people owe us. And I believe that it's a two-way street. You also have to think, what are our responsibilities, particularly in a wealthy country like the United States and in other wealthy, what are our responsibilities to guide society, to build the systems that create uh a world, an economy that is just and sustainable and equitable and um, not leading us as we have now towards a continued dangerous path of potential destruction. We have a few clips I'll be playing in a few minutes. Um, one from the Secretary General of the UN speaking at Davos lately um, about the critical moment we're in. Um, one from Senator Sanders and this economic bill of rights and a lot and what the global reporting initiative will um is focusing on so that'll be a great push for the next part of the conversation um but is there any policies out there right now that you could think of like if we prioritize this policy it'll impact all the human rights i have a few ideas and out there too is there any policy in our audience feel free to type it in the chat here even if you're in person um you know, I encourage you to, it's an exercise to dive deeper as Nareth from Make Time Flow is right here. You know, we need to be in the right circumstances to dive deeper. And I hope that these questions we're asking you gets the wheels turning so that maybe you connect some dots that you didn't think about before. So Bob, you know, is there a policy and it's a trick question to a degree, but is there any policies out there that if you, it were impacted, it would reverberate across all the other kind of like rights and responsibilities that we're going towards. I'm gonna punt a little bit because it's such a huge question and it depends a little bit as many political questions, where you're sitting, what are the things that are hitting you the hardest? But look, the basic dignity and, uh, and uh, fundamental right that we are all, we all deserve equal treatment. I mean, it's one of the oldest concepts goes back to the golden rule, goes back to religious documents like the Bible and others. So, but we have to keep fighting for that because people are constantly trying to cut us off from equal treatment. So it, we ask what is, uh, what would help? Well, systems that open up voting. We now have uh, a extremely aggressive attempt to deny people uh, the right to vote in this country and all over. So being engaged with giving people voice and the ability to determine our future by expressing that voice. Access to education, critical. Access to healthcare in the United States. You know, I have some serious medical uh, challenges and disabilities, and I lived in France for a number of years as a, as a teenager. My parents moved there, and I was covered for my expensive and difficult uh, 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 health condition, which was hemophilia, it's a bleeding disorder. I was covered by French national health insurance, even though I was not even a citizen. And that coverage allowed me to walk again. So here in the United States, it was often too expensive. So in the United States, healthcare as a fundamental human right, housing as a right. You know, you build housing, people who are in the business of development, they tend to want to build houses that will earn money. And it's very hard to build a house that you can sell to an extremely poor person. So the disparities in our, uh, in our economic system and in our, in our um, revenue, income, assets, they prevent us from having housing. That's ridiculous. I mean, a country like the United States with its wealth still has a huge un uh, unhoused uh, population, people on the street, people being pushed out. Uh, rents dr being uh, driven sky high. Those are all failures in the system that are denying people access to a dignified life and we have to fight them. And I'll just say, you know, I know some people are utterly disgusted by politics and everyone has a right. Politics is disgusting. It's also gone completely off the rails into craziness, but that is not the time to withdraw. Every time you withdraw from politics, you're giving the support and the vote to some kook who wants to support this kind of disparity. So, um, you know, I could keep going. I mean, the trafficking in uh, young women, of women of all kind, or, or general uh, failure to protect and honor women's rights, other people with disabilities, on and on and on. But if we keep coming back to the, the notion of our fundamental equality, 
built into our own constitutional documents. And the need to respect that, to fight for that, that permeates everything. And virtually every policy is a battle over exactly who is going to have access to what. And I think that the, the answer is to open it and be more inclusive and embracing. And unfortunately, there's very many forces that want to shrink it and deny and force people into positions of inferiority. I'll stop there, Tom, but I think you can get the sense that I do so only with that sense that we need to move on. I know you have a great grasp on a lot of policies and it will take a collective effort. My perspective on why we're not moving forward, even though I do think we have this majority coalition, is money is overpowering people. Yeah. I think that in, in about a minute, we'll hear about this a little bit more as it starts to play, but if we were to take big money out of politics, say with an overturned Citizens United decision, that would, I think, reverberate across all of our industries to let the people's voices be heard. I think that, again, I'm just so confident that while we have our different specific policies on how we can move industries forward and advance human rights, I think that this, I think, you know, I asked this poll in the chat, you know, what is the current priority value in our systems? You know, money, power, people. I think everyone out there, and I haven't looked at the, the, the poll responses yet, I don't think anyone's choosing people. I think that you know, money and power are just two overwhelming forces in our systems, and that is preventing this progress that we desperately need. And you know, I use this word critical a lot. I just think there's a, a clock on our window to achieve progress. We, we, every day that goes by that we do not produce these policies, big money and big power are using our collective systems to advance their own causes. And that is preventing the people-based coalition from advancing and at the stake of a lot. Um, so let's see here. Um, this is on captions. Of we need cooperation, yet we face fragmentation. And I'm not here to sugarcoat the scale of that challenge or the sorry state of our world. We can't confront problems unless we look them squarely in the eye. And we are looking into the eye of a Category 5 hurricane. Our world is plagued by a perfect storm on a number of fronts. Start with the short term, a global economic crisis. The outlook, as we all know, is bleak. Many parts of the world face recession, and the entire world faces a slowdown. And we see deepening inequalities and the rapidly unfolding cost of living crisis affecting women and girls the most. Greenhouse gas emissions are at record levels and growing. The commitment to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees is nearly going up in smoke. Without further action, we are headed to a 2.8 degree increase, and the consequences, as we all know, would be devastating. All these challenges are interlinked, and they are piling up like cars in a chain reaction crash. In 1944, FDR proposed an economic bill of rights, but he died a year later and was never able to fulfill that vision. Our job, 75 years later, is to complete what Roosevelt started. And that is why today I am proposing a 21st century economic bill of rights that every American, regardless of his or her income, is entitled to the right to a decent job that pays a living wage, the right to quality health care, the right to a complete education, the right to affordable housing, the right to a clean environment, and the right to a secure retirement. My friends, these are my values, and that is why I call myself a democratic socialist. So this, this video here again, outline some basic rights that we are not prioritizing. Um, you know, and this is the, the question that I have the audience is like, again, why haven't these priorities 
that have been attempted since the 19, late 1930s and 40s, why aren't they progressed? Why aren't they prioritized? A job, an adequate wage and a decent living, which I think Senator Sanders has combined, a decent home, medical care, economic protection, essentially social security, and a good education. You know, these policies are so important, and yet we are missing the mark on prioritizing them. And we need to do better. And you know, I want to transition this part of the conversation to what Bob's working on now. Um, I, I mean, if you have any quick thoughts on these, yeah, I, I do. I want to say, I mean, obviously, Frank Roosevelt faced an enormous uh, economic disaster in the reset in the Great Depression. But I want to talk about uh, virtually every one of these has a major government program now behind it, or a, a regulatory agency whose job is to fix this. But they have been cut off at the knees over and over again. This is why politics is so important. So we've had all kinds of uh, attempts to secure jobs, improve them, to attach benefits to them, require them. We have a National Labor Relations Act, but the National Labor Relations Board has been gutted by, and here I have to be partisan, the Republican Congress and Republican presidents. They have not put the commissioners on it, and it can't function adequate wage and decent living, refusal to raise the, the uh, minimum wage, which, you know, we had a fight for 15 here in Massachusetts, which we won, but it took uh, tremendous organizing and a commitment, a decent home. You know, we had uh, various provisions after World War II that helped provide low cost mortgages. Um, as I was saying, we have an inadequate supply and a broken market for homes now. And as we see, uh, interest rates go up. Interest rates are going up largely because of war, because of Vladimir Putin. And there are other, obviously, medical care I talked about. 1948, most countries in the world instituted national health insurance. Uh, the United States did not. Why? Because the American Medical Association, which, by the way, regrets this, the group of doctors and many others, hired a, uh, an advertising agency to come up with the scariest phrase to block it, which was socialized medicine. That phrase is erroneous, misleading, broken, wrong, and yet you still hear people using it. And again, you know, I have been all over the world. Other countries have medical care, and there are problems, and there are inc uh, incompatibilities, and there are other overlaid systems of insurance. But no other major country uh, denies that uh, uh, medical care is a human right. It's one of the most unequal systems of distribution um, and it creates fantastic new technologies that are then not available. And as I used to say when I was running for office, America gives the best coverage at the lowest cost to the people who least need it, that is to the healthy. And we had to create Medicare and Medicaid because private markets would simply not cover poor people and old people. Why? Because they tend to get sick. So that was broken. All the So that sort of folds into number Five and number six, we're still struggling with this. And I'm glad to say that the new governor of Massachusetts is proposing free community college for people over the age of 25. So these, uh, there, there are many reasons why these go off kilter. There are many answers that people have tried to implement. There are many examples from other countries that have made much more progress on this and why it's being blocked politically over and over and over again. Why? Because money is flooding into the system to elect people who will protect the status quo. And, and Casey, I do feel a little strongly about some of these things. So, <laughs> so eloquently said, Bob. Um, you know, the one thing that's not on here that's now a super priority is the environment. Right. Um, and I think that's like kind of our transition here. Um, there's this great stat that there is progress being made. Um, but there's limited progress being made here in our country to a degree compared to the rest of the world. So I'd love to transition it to a degree to your work with the Global Reporting Initiative. Yeah. And you know, what can we learn here as a country about what the EU is doing um, to prioritize sustainability as a human right as well? And you, know, you used this great phrase, how are we creating systems where finance serves sustainability and not vice versa. And I thought that really stuck with me. And, um, you know, you, you use this definition of sustainability. So can you define your term, definition of sustainability? Because it's so 
holistic in a few different meetings so that our audience understands that? And then, you know, how do we build these systems around sustainability and what are you focusing on? Well, sustainability has meant different things and there are different words for it in other languages, but the basic concept going back to Gro Brundtland's commission back in the 19, 1987, I think it was, which is that we can prosper at this time without sacrificing the prosperity of future generations. And that includes not destroying the environment on which all human life uh, depends. So now, one of the things about sustainability is that in the United States over the years, last 25 or 30 years, it's tended to have an environmental quality. If you look at it, let's say in India or China or Latin America, it also has a very fundamental social quality. And uh, so I'm going to try to summarize this. You know, when we think about capitalism, what is capitalism? Well, it is the ability to pool money, financial resources, and to they're pooled in different ways, and then to give them to some entity to do something with. And mostly it's been to give that uh, money to an entity, whether it was way back to the Dust East India Company or some uh, royally appointed group. The idea is to go out and make money, and to get a hold of resources or come up with an idea or to create a market and to make money. And so uh, for a very long time, including now, the idea of capitalism was focused on one kind of capital, financial capital. You take financial capital, you put it into some business model or whatever, it runs through the, you know, the, the washing cycle of all different mixed stuff, and then it comes out, and there's either more or less, and there's more or less, and then somebody figure out, figures out if there's more, who gets the more? So that decision is also very powerful. We're not against the creation of money, although sometimes, often, the pursuit of it creates all kinds of negative things. So what's going on in the world today is people are saying, there isn't just one form of capital. There's financial capital. There's human capital or intellectual capital. There's natural capital. And people discuss. Some people say there's manufactured capital. That is all the stuff that other people built for us before we continue to use. And so, you, so now the idea is, when you run a business, and as is true here at the CIC, if you're creating a business, you have to take a mix. You take finance, you take people, you take their ideas, maybe you have to get an office. This is an interesting idea because capital is now being invested less in stuff and more in ideas or brands or things like that. So you take all those different capitals, you run them through the same machine as always, but now you see what the recipe looks like and out it comes. You enhance and deplete financial, you enhance or deplete finance, uh, uh, natural. And that is where the measurement systems and the understanding of a kind of multi-capitalism or integrated capitalism is going. And there's a huge international battle now going on between the people who say, oh, that kind of thinking, that won't make me rich, or I don't like that, it's too complicated. It involves people who shouldn't have any say. There's millions of arguments. Um, they're quite interesting. Maybe we could talk about some of them at another session. But that battle has now taken many forms. It is, you know, what do investors think? And there's a whole field known as ESG, environment, social, and governance. Should you consider ESG factors when you are a company? The answer is yes. And what the Global Reporting Initiative is, was an effort to create a new system of accounting. That new system of accounting looks at energy, looks at climate, looks at human rights, looks at many, many other factors according to a commonly accepted, of course, that's an enormous debate, set of indicators. And those indicators then release information. Well, here's the interesting thing, and we, you can ask me more about this, otherwise I might go on too long. But the interesting thing is companies, 78% of the biggest 250 corporations in the world now use that system even if they don't release the information because it helps them coordinate internally and understand what they're doing. There's an enormous debate in investors. Do we want this information? Does it show us opportunities? Does it show us risks? And now you mentioned the Europeans. The Europeans are saying, well, 
we don't really care whether you make more money. We care whether you're destroying our countries. And so now they are pushing companies through, I could run through the organizations, but they've passed a law in the European Union saying you must release this information. That law is going to affect 50,000 companies in Europe alone, which is a market of 800 million people. And so all of that's going on now at once. But fundamentally, it's about rethinking, as you named this thing, it's about rethinking what is capitalism? What is the system? What rewards destruction? What rewards prosperity? And how can we build that into the system so that money, power, ideas flow towards a positive vision, a just and sustainable and equitable world, or whether it continues the downward path that may be flattening out a little bit, but we're still on a downward path because the old systems still dominate and the old systems are still driving highly destructive behavior. And most of us feel disempowered to do anything about it. I actually feel we do have power, but we can talk about that a little later. What can you know, we as a room here think about in terms of the messaging? You, you've hit so many good messaging on these points, but I think that there's so much going on. At least I like using the stat that 6%, uh, six companies control 90% of what the U.S. consumes from media. Mm. You know, we're, We are clearly not winning this messaging battle. Like I think an innovative strategy, and I welcome any innovative strategies out there for people on how we can better communicate this stuff is, you know, what if we doubled down on our investment in, say, a PBS or, you know, a public broadcasting system that talked about this similar to this program. But like, the, to, that's a innovative policy. But from a messaging standpoint, what are you seeing resonates when you're talking about this stuff that leaders can use or activists, everybody can use, I shouldn't say just leaders, but we can use to push these issues forward? Well, it's a huge question and one that I think your audience here and beyond uh, has important insights to. I will say, since I'm now in my 60s, uh, things have changed a lot and we need to continue. But you mentioned climate. I didn't really put it. Um, I organized the first big public meeting on climate change here in Boston in April of 1992. And that was at the Boston Museum of Science. And we got all kinds of people together. Al Gore came. Uh, he was uh, just about to be picked to be um, uh, Bill Clinton's running mate. Um, I spoke. We had all kinds of leaders there. And I'll tell you, I came out of that meeting. We showed the blue planet. I don't know if any of you have seen that planet, but it's such a beautiful image of what the world, what the earth really looks like and why it's precious. And we watched that. We were all deeply moved. And I came out of there. Uh, Gore had just put out his book, uh, Earth in the Balance. And I thought, you know, God, this climate question, it, it, it's, it, it's so huge. It's going to take 10 whole years to deal with it. And that was 31 years ago. So there are important things to, I mean, that's tragic. And as I see people waking up, I'm thrilled. And like, why the hell didn't that happen 20 years ago? Well, there are a lot of answers to that, but part of it is actually human cognitive ability. I just want to focus on that. We are and Gore talks about, we are cognitively designed to pay attention to things in the immediate. What's happening right now? What's new? Oh, that's exciting. Oh, is that dangerous? But what's short term? We are very poor at thinking uh, long term. Our financial systems are disgustingly uh, corrupt and thinking about because of the math of it. You know, any discounted cash flow that's discounted at higher than 7% disappears to zero in a short amount of time, 10, 12, 15 years. So the market basically looks at long-term investments or long-term opportunities generally pretty poorly. And of course, we trade. We trade on tiny little things that happen rather than deep long-term investments. That's one reason you have to have the government step in to establish a new base, whether it's a new base for electric cars or all different. You have to have someone make that transition. So those cognitive problems, we also react, we often freeze in the face of danger, you know, we, so, and we don't want to hear bad news. So we are distracted, et cetera, et cetera. And our leaders have been largely gutless, um, ranging from those who continued to deny and who denied for many years that climate change was real. And secondly, even if they know it, they're not willing to risk their election on talking about it. Just recently, the, the uh, election 
uh, presidential election prior to this one, there were zero questions about climate change in every single, across all the presidential debates, zero. And that tells you something about our media that couldn't even be bothered to ask about it. That is now changing. And I just want to finish up this answer by saying, uh, I read a story about Republican poll uh, people who have learned that the uh, younger voters uh, who now form 40% of the vote, um, those younger voters will not even look at a candidate who denies climate change, whether they're Republican, whether they're independent, that's it. Now, 40% is close to 50%. And when you get to 50% and all those people who don't want to change or don't want to hear bad news or, you know, when they start, sadly, I guess, from a human standpoint, dying off, but positively from a political sense, you need that shift in perspective. You need things, uh, whether it's sober scientific analysis or the kind of brave activity of the Sunrise Movement or many other folks we are now seeing. And now we have a governor who is uh, installing a climate leader as a cabinet level position, something that Governor Baker, who was a climate denier in 2010, never thought to do. So finally, we're seeing that movement. I think the question is, can we align incentives in our market system? Can we, uh, can we redesign systems that are currently pre-producing the wrong outcomes? And can we do it fast enough? Because as the head has said, we blew 20 years that where we could have done this with much smaller increments. And every year that goes by, the, the task and the cost of what we want to do goes up. But we don't really have any choice. It reminds me of, and I was talking to Cynthia from Venture Cafe about this earlier, that and it really reminds me of Bill McKibben's recent book of we're trending as a society for decades now towards the individual rather than the collective, rather than considering every individual is part of the collective. You know, we're, we're building bigger homes, we're building bigger cars, we're moving farther away from each other. We, we need to challenge ourselves to again, through the exercises, I hope like this, to talk about how we're collectively working together. And I wanna also respect the uh, virtual attendees and you know, they submitted some questions earlier and one of them was centered around greenwashing, Bob. Like, you know, like ESG sometimes can be used, I feel like to be like, oh, we're meeting these, but are you really? Like, do you mind like just briefly touching on that yeah. and like the, the EU policies and the global reporting issues attempts to limit that? Well, it's, it's an interesting lesson talking to folks out there. Um, and I've now lived long enough to see this. So you start off by saying, you know, shouldn't we sell organic food? Or, you know, it, it might be a little more expensive. Oh, nobody will buy that. What a terrible idea. Nobody will pay any more. It doesn't matter. Chemicals are fine. Nobody cares. And then you see more and more people saying, well, actually, uh, as a human being, as a mom, as a this to that, I do care and I will spend a little more. So suddenly then everybody says, oh, uh, hmm, okay, organic, we're organic. We don't know what the hell it means. We're going to call it natural, organic. And so then, so you go from people who ignore it to suddenly people who claim it, right? And then they claim it and it immediately blows away all meaning. So then you need a new step, which is, wait a minute. Organic means this, or natural means that. And there are different ways of enforcing that. There's government rules, there's peer pressure. You know, I have to say, in one sense, you're right. There used to be institutions where people spent their time, local clubs, religious organizations, unions. what? Unions. unions. Although unions are experiencing a, a surge right now, thank, thanks. Uh, but, um, uh, and, and there is well documented that we have been broken into smaller and smaller atomistic pieces and that that's a problem. On the other hand, some things have gotten easier, um, both for good and with good and bad outcomes. I'll tell you something. I grew up before the internet. I know that hard for some people to imagine, but um, so let me just describe briefly as a student activist, if I wanted to have a meeting, I had to go first mimeograph, that's technology that we had before photocopying. You have to mimeograph something, you'd have to put it in the mail, you'd have to send it, and then you just hope people would show up. Or maybe you got the phone and tried to call people. It was impossible to reach people. And um, anyone who went to college in that era will remember. I mean, if you had a, a girlfriend, boyfriend, 
You had no idea where they were. You had to go wandering around the campus to try and find them. That was true politically, too. You had to wander around and try to find. And that's why these uh, groups with that were clearly connected were a way to reach people. And But now we can reach people, as we know, so easily. But now we're overwhelmed with people trying to reach us and sell us stuff and lie to us and promote things that are wrong. And now that requires a new human response. So, um, you know, I don't even remember the very first part of credit. Oh, the message. Well, the good news is the message is getting through. Voters now care. Young people now care. Um, you know what? I just want to come back. Even though uh, Sunrise has had its challenges, they've been challenges of too many people getting involved too quickly. And the willingness of someone uh, like um, Ocasio-Cortez to walk into the speaker's office as a junior, absolutely first week of her service to walk in and support a group that were sit in, that was a level of political bravery and connectedness that you never seen before. I mean, if that had happened before, that would have been the last we ever heard from her. She would have been working out of a broom closet 20 miles away from Congress. So that ability to communicate has been a blessing and a danger. And um, so messages are getting out. Uh, the problem really is, as much as anything, that people feel overwhelmed. And I'll just finish. There's an incredible leader named Frances Moore LePay. A lot of people uh, don't. She used to be. She's awesome. She, she used to be uh, uh, nationally famous. Everybody knew who she was because her book, A Diet for a Small Planet, triggered much of the food revolution uh, in America. Well, she's still out there and she's uh, writing books. And one of the things that she and her husband talk about is that human beings need a sense of agency you know, that we are empowered, that we can have an effect. We need a sense of meaning, why we're doing something. And we need to have a sense of connection, agency, meaning, connection, or sometimes they call it power, meaning, and connection. Well, modern society cuts at all three, and particularly for young people, makes you feel disempowered. Like, ah, you can't do anything, don't even try. We have a crisis of meaning, whether that's religious or political or uh, or just a depression or cynicism, crisis of meaning. It doesn't matter. You know, you, it doesn't matter. The world's random. Everything's random. We're all going to die. You know, welcome. Um, and the final is connection. Who do we connect to that helps support our sense of empowerment, our sense of meaning? So what I would say is institutions and people who can consciously work to develop, particularly in young people, but in all of us, a sense of empowerment, a sense of why it's important that we act, and a sense of connectivity. And when you see that happening, as you sometimes do in politics and in other places, amazing things can happen. And you can spend all the money you want. And when people are ready to feel empowered, to act on their sense of meaning and to be connected, whole systems get swept away. And that's starting to happen. But again, the question is, how fast? We are on that clock. I mean, even in our clock here, we have about you know, 15, 20 minutes. So I highly encourage everyone to use the hybrid technology to submit chat uh, questions that they'd want prioritized and to upload those questions because it's much easier for me as the host to be able to see them and if they are upvoted. Um, but it gets me, you know, some thought provoking things that came up from that, you know, with the internet as a new tool, what rights do we have around the internet? Does everyone have access to the internet, right? Like, I think that's a huge conversation that we're not necessarily having. And, you know, maybe that's a whole nother talk. Um, but like what new type of rights out there that are trending in this direction, you know, the right to transportation? Why is Massachusetts still not updating the oldest public infrastructure in the country? Why aren't we prioritize that? We have to. Um, and I hope that, you know, Massachusetts has this long, deep history of being a leader you know, on so many fronts. And with the last administration, you know, I felt like we were managing and that's why I supported you for governor because I knew you would be leading. Um, so I guess, why are you encouraged by Massachusetts with, you know, Governor Healy, Mayor Wu, um, you know, how can Massachusetts lead going forward as well? Um, and I think we have a responsibility to, to lead. I even recently read, you know, John Adams wrote like, we're not a state, we're a commonwealth. We are in this together. And I was so inspired by that. And Massachusetts has this deep history of working together to lead. How do you see us leading the country and hopefully punching above our weight class to lead the world forward? Well, I mean, the thing that jumps to mind is that we have six constitutional offices 
in Massachusetts. We have governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, auditor, secretary of state, and treasurer. Six, five of them are now, wait, I put up four, five are now, five of them are now women. And that was a battle that has been fought and has been achieved. Um, again, why not a long time ago? That's a, a question itself. But uh, in Mayor Wu, 38 years old. I mean, she can be a leader for the next 35 or 40 years. And she is a woman of tremendous dynamism who crushed all kinds of barriers on her way. And she did it by being authentic and by having a vision of what transportation means for a city, what education means for a city. And now we have a governor who has shown her bravery in going up against the Trump administration. Uh, again, as I mentioned, led by creating uh, and as treating climate as an emergency, not as an afterthought. And, you know, look, I, I mean, you, you know, I, I ran for governor. So if I say something that isn't totally positive about Governor Baker, Governor Baker wasted eight years on many topics. He did not lay out a challenge. Like, you know, we respond to challenges. One reason we remember the Kennedys is because they didn't just say, tell me what you want and I'll give it to you. They said, we are going to meet this great, great challenge, which is this or that. And whether they did a great job or whether it was possible, that's almost secondary. You know, uh, when John F. Kennedy said, we're going to the moon, he said, we're going to do this not because it's easy, but because it is hard. And that is a sentiment that we lose. We like, hey, tell me what you want. You're a consumer. Let me see if I can sell you this. I'll try to dazzle you with stuff. No, people respond. They are inspired and you know, as somebody trained in biblical tradition, inspire means bring your breath in, breathing in something that, that fills you with energy and force and ready to move forward. And I think one of the most important things in politics or making change is having that vision, is thinking we, we are here, but we could be there. So some of the talk about, well, we're all going to die, actually removes that inspiration. It, it's depressing. So anyway, uh, there's there's many ways to look at this. I mean, Governor Baker, you know, if you go back and read his speeches, he says, it's really great. We're working together. This year we did 3%. Next year we're going to be 4%. He never, and by the way, speaking to uh, one very prominent Democratic uh, uh, politician a few years ago, he said, if you have such a huge um, popularity rating, why don't you use it? Ask people to do something inspiring. And the weird thing is we were, we were so caught up in the disgusting behavior of President Trump and all the people who defended him that Governor Baker seemed like, oh, he's great because he's so quiet and we have no idea what he's doing and we like that. So again, there's sort of what are we willing to tolerate or what are we willing to ask of our leaders? And we have to be willing for our leaders to make us uncomfortable, to ask mm -hmm. us to do things, but to do so in the name of something beautiful. And one of the things about Bill McKibben, who's a very close friend, is that he always talks about, again, that if we can hang on and make the changes, that we have a beautiful and diverse future that is far more remarkable even than anything we've seen today. But we have to hold on to that. We have to support each other across differences. We have to be willing to make sacrifices, not necessarily material, but to put in time, to put in our energy, to put in our ideas, and not to sit back and say, well, you're all pretty stupid because this isn't going to work. So anyway, I pretty clear on this. <laughs> I appreciate the energy, Bobby. You yeah. got me the breath. I feel like I'm, you know, everyone out there, you know, take that breath in, feel inspired. You know, we're, we're... there's a, a few thoughts that came to mind. Um, we were filming a, um, a quantum mechanics, a quantum engineering workshop in Venture Cafe not too long ago. And they're like, anything challenging takes thousands of people in hundreds of thousands of millions of hours to push forward Absolutely. like every conversation you have out there with someone in civics can push it forward and um it's it's important it, it, they all add up to our future and you know we someone i another thought was in this room just last week uh someone was talking about ed tech where learning is not a soft sport it is challenging we need the right conditions to learn. And he even said, as a professor, I believe at Harvard was the number one condition to learning is socioeconomic status. How can we be inspired for the youth? I just saw Neil out there, you know, asking about the youth, how we, what can we do with the youth? How can we expect our youth to grasp these 
long-term problems without giving them the security to be their best. It's just, it's, it's unacceptable to me. And I think we can work more in that sector um, and on all fronts. And I, I guess I wanna turn to you, Bob, in our last few minutes of, you know, big goals, like big dynamic goals, like in a, in a much better world where there's a majority coalition in government, like we kind of have here in Massachusetts now, like what could the future of this flourishing economy of this new different type of economic system look like, you know, from a financial structure or just from a, a human-based self-actualization is empowered, right, protected theme? Well, that's easy. No. <laughs> um, I'm gonna take a piece of your question because we're here at the CIC. So the CIC, where I worked for a year uh, on various projects, um, is a wonderful institution, except for one thing that I've always expressed some, not the CIC itself, but the model we have for the developing ideas. So, um, and I'm not condemning CIC, it's just that the, the, uh, you create these ideas and then you go, you want to bring them to market, you want to develop them, you want to grow, you want to gain revenue. So what do you do? You have to look for investors. You have to look for an angel investor and, and then eventually venture capital and you have to have rounds and blah, blah, blah. Well, what happens with that? Um, gradually ownership is shifted where the priority is to the shareholder and the owner and the investor and that investor eventually acquires the ability to hire or fire whoever set up the company or to guide it. And the and, and I'm not anti-capitalist, I'm not at anti-venture capital, but you can see that's just one model of ownership. Not everything should go through the VC model. Not everything should lead to people having shares and to looking for markets because sometimes it leads to absolutely wonderful stuff. Sometimes it leads to being locked into a system of ownership which is not necessarily the ideal one for society. There are other forms of ownership. Um, and in fact, I would say that if you wanna look about economic systems, the question of ownership has to be dominant. I mean, if you're looking at uh, communities of color, what have they been denied most significantly over the entire period? Ownership, ownership in businesses, ownership of homes, uh, ownership of all kinds of other things that that's what builds wealth. That's why you have, uh, you know, this famous study done by the, the Boston Federal Reserve that showed that the average net worth of a white family is $250,000 in assets. The average of a black family is $8. That means that debt, their debt and their assets balance out to $8. Hispanic, it's close to zero. So that accumulation of wealth comes from ownership, the ability to pass ownership on, to pass ass assets on. And because of systematic economic and racial discrimination, people have been denied that. And that's one of the core arguments to address that explicitly. Um, so I could go on about that, but there are ownership of land. Uh, land, they're not, as they say, not making any more of it. So the value keeps going up. Well, you could have community land trusts. There's a whole new economy movement. I encourage people to look at neweconomy.net. There are many other, uh, there's all kinds of systems of community ownership, which are not perfect. They get into then human politics that you have to work with other owners and annoying people who have different views. But the idea that you automatically go from idea to funding to private markets to, you know, then looking for an exit strategy and all that stuff, that's only one pathway. And sometimes it bottles up technologies. A great example of this is also pharmaceuticals. You know, we develop key innovations in our public labs, and then we hand them those that uh, information over to pharmaceutical companies who then charge enormous amounts of money because there, there's a special market around pharmaceuticals. Of course, they need some money to keep going, but some of it is just flat out exploitation because of people who are, to use the technical term, they're not, uh, they're inelastic to price for medical products they depend on. So again, I could go on, but if people are gonna think about how in the long term do we wanna make change, we wanna have more varied forms of ownership, we wanna have wider forms of democracy, we wanna include participation, we wanna provide encouragement, we wanna people give the people skills right from the beginning. And the key to the 20 years from now are the kids in school today. And that's why it is incredible to me that local communities say, well, I don't have kids, I don't care about the local school system. That's ridiculous. And building that sense of community, 
of being able to come together to achieve great goals. Well, not everybody can change the world overnight, but you can change your local community. You could be an example. And to go back to your question about Massachusetts, we are in a position to do dramatic things that the rest of the country cannot do. And part of my willingness to run for office was to basically encourage the legislature, which is full of great people, but is very cautious to reach out and grab those big goals. And we're all in a position to support that. You sparked so many things in my head. And I hope all of you, you know, everyone out there, like write down what is sparked in your mind so that we can collect that to create future programs. I was going to, there's a whole bunch of organizations that uh, I was saying we should give folks the URLs oh, and so people can follow up. And, you know, uh, there are extraordinary ways right here, right in Massachusetts, right now, amazing things happening in our universities, uh, including the, the uh, state, you know, UMass Boston, UMass Amherst, they're doing amazing things. And, you know, too often I hear people say, oh, I wish something were happening. Well, it is. So often when I type something into, the, uh, into Google uh, or your preferred search engine, um, you, you know, I find that there are people working and it's easier than ever to just call people, write, write them up or to take whatever you're working on uh, that you're passionate about and building support for that. It goes both ways. CIC is an example of this, and I hope that you bring in tons of people and, you know, let everybody out there, you got to help him get bigger and bigger, recommend this, send him advice, um, and, uh, and I'll come back and talk about some other thing with just the same amount of speed and energy whenever you like. I appreciate that so much, Bob. You, you know, we're getting close to the end, so, yeah, yeah I want to ask anyone out there, you know, who could be a great guest on this show? What other programs out there? This is supposed to be a community forum. We want to really reach that next level collectively. I mean, quick thoughts, as you said, other forums, because we're this talk is about financial structures, you know, cooperatively owned businesses. You know, I'm definitely trying to turn my video production agency into a cooperatively owned business for, yeah. because I want our team to be around forever and working and feeling like they're empowered. Ownership. Um, ownership, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, there's this other quote that hopefully sparks. We can either have wealth concentrated in the hands of the few, or we can have a functioning democracy. We cannot have both. And at the time in this society where we have the largest wealth inequality there is, we, we clearly don't have a functioning democracy. I really, at least at the national scale, and land doesn't vote. It's another big piece of it that we can get into a whole other talk about. Um, well, let me just, I, I want to come back. I used to run something called the New Economy Coalition, and this was built out of the, well, it's a lot of different things that came together, but it was also partly driven by the vision of E.F. Schumacher, who talked about small is beautiful and thinking about alternatives to large industrialized forms of technology and looking at more local, smaller, simpler, um, and beautiful stuff. Um, his uh, book, Small is Beautiful, is a little strange in that it's a collection of essays on somewhat different topics. But if you want to be inspired, you should you should look at that. However, this the website neweconomy.net has about 200 organizations working on different pieces. And I'll just say right now, some of them are amazing and well-established and working on great stuff. And each one represents a huge community themselves. And some of them are a little out there. Uh, you know, there are four people with a great idea. Who knows where the great idea is going to go, where the four people are going to go. But if you work your way just through clicking on all those logos and seeing what different people are working on, like, you know, community financial systems and all different kinds of stuff, cooperatives, uh, all the amazing, uh, and the history of cooperatives is a fascinating one. They used to dominate the United States in the 19th century, and there's still 100 million Americans who are connected to cooperative without even sometimes knowing it. Um, there were African-American cooperatives that uh, built a separate economy because of racism was denying them access, and they were eventually crushed by white racist government structures. But th that's a whole proud part of American uh, history that we don't know. So newcomy.net is just one place to start. We'll put a whole bunch of other stuff up, yeah. but it's out there. It isn't talked about on, you know, I mean, here's why I agree. Mainstream media is kind of limited and what it discusses. And, you know, every time I find myself reading about Harry and Meghan, I go, what am I doing? This is a ridiculous distraction of my time. So we can all take a little time away from the things that preoccupy us perhaps unnecessarily and find this rich, exciting community that is right out there. It's just not easily visible until you go to the internet. 
we do have this amazing tool. And I want to be respectful of the Venture Cafe's programming, so we'll, we'll wind down here. But I want to reiterate, I truly am optimistic that the majority of us hum humans on this beautiful planet are on the same page with our values. And we don't have to start from scratch. You know, We're just building upon each other's passions. So we, we can build this new, better system collectively than you know, just living it alone and facing climate destruction without you know, giving it, we have to try, you know, and that's what this program is. We're trying, this is my way because the videographer, this is what I know, um, and I promise to you, all you out there, we'll continue to advance our programming for both in person and online. We want this to be as dynamic as possible. So, but I am so grateful that you all attended. I thank you for participating. Thank you to everybody out there participating in the chat. All of this will help us build better programming so that we can invite more people on, that we can get deeper, that we can ask the right questions that Bob told me. It's all about, my role in this is to make sure I'm getting better at the messaging to ask the right questions. So any final thoughts, Bob? Just this is part of the large conversation that is already taking place. It needs to take place at an even wider, more urgent level until it finally breaks through as it has started to do into our politics, into our power structures, and so that we eventually shift the entire sort of cultural awareness about what is appropriate. Some things that were accepted that we now think are utterly disgusting, they were accepted with very little question for a long time, and they are being steadily eroded and uh, dismantled. But where in 50 years are people gonna look back and say, they could have done a bit more here, they could have done more there. This is a moment of, of, you know, people use this term, inflection point is correct. And we in this era, in this, my generation, thankfully kind of fading away with our old boring ideas, new generation coming on board. But the worst thing would be to take the foot off the pedal at the moment we have the skills and we have the opportunity and we have the absolute need to engage. We have the momentum. So to sign off, grounded in respectful conversation, we'll build a more equitable, just, and sustainable world together. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Until next time. Thank you very much.